Good afternoon and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's Wednesday webinar. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator. I would like to welcome Willie Walker and his guest, Glenn Youngkin, the co-chief executive officer of the Carlisle Group. Willie and Glenn will discuss the global macroeconomic outlook for 2020 and beyond, Carlisle's long-term strategy and how the firm is navigating the crisis, how the firm's businesses are faring, and how Carlisle is adapting to new trends and thinking about the future investment opportunities. Thank you for joining us, and now I will turn the call over to Willie. Thanks, Susan, and um, welcome to another Walker Wednesday webinar. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have my friend Glenn Youngkin uh, with us today. Um, Glenn is a friend of over 25 years that dates both of us, uh, but we were at business school together and have been friends ever since, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have him join me today. Uh, I'm going to start out with some comments on the commercial real estate industry, as I typically do, and then I'm going to turn it over and uh, talk about private equity, Carlisle, how Glenn and his co-CEO are managing the firm today, and what uh, he sees as far as the outlook going forward for both private equity, the portfolio companies that Carlisle has invested in, and the overall economy. Uh, let me... Uh, start in by always reiterating these are very very challenging times for um, our world uh, our company uh, excuse me our country and our communities and so to all of you who are tuning in today uh, we send you and your families best wishes for safety uh, and health during these difficult times um, we did earnings this morning at Walker and Dunlop, um, and so I can now talk about a number of the things that we hadn't been able to talk about on previous webcasts. Um, we had a very, very strong Q1, but I think the more important data that we put out in our earnings call and, and script afterwards was what we've been seeing during the month of April. Um, our, our Q1 origination numbers were at uh, record highs, and that was driven a lot by um, falling interest rates in March, as well as uh, tightening spreads once the Fed stepped in and started to buy uh, agency paper. Um, as I have given people on this call an update over the past several weeks, agency spreads have remained very, very tight. Um, they're now right around swaps plus 65. Freddie K uh, deals are pricing a little bit inside of that, and I know that the Freddie K deal that priced last week um, went off uh, oversubscribed and inside from pricing standpoint of what they had published previous to the sale. So the agency CMBS market is functioning extremely well. Um, before this call, Glenn and I got about 200 email questions that came in, and one of the significant questions I saw a number of times was what's happening in the CMBS world outside of agency CMBS. Um, AAA CMBS is trading at about swaps plus 150 right now. Uh, that's come in quite a bit. That had widened out closer to swaps plus 200. Um, so you are seeing some tightening there. Some of you may have seen in the Starwood earnings call uh, day before yesterday that Jeff DeMonica mentioned that Starwood is actually looking at uh, the CMBS market as quite promising to coming back and providing financing uh, to the market. Um, I would put forth that we need the VIX to chill out a little bit before we can really get any significant volume going in the CMBS world. Um, a VIX that's bouncing around north of 25 uh, makes it exceedingly difficult for even the best CMBS shops to actually price with any confidence that they're going to be able to deliver to the market uh, the deals at any kind of pricing that makes them or their investors any money. So as long as the VIX is bouncing around, I don't really care what happens to spreads. Um, it's going to be hard for CMBS originators to do that. But once you get a little bit more stability in the markets, I wouldn't be surprised if CMBS comes back and presents itself as a capital uh, a source for commercial real estate. Um, the other thing that we mentioned in our earnings call was just the amount of agency business that we did during the month of April. Um, and so we had a record Q1 um, sort of across the board in all executions. Uh, but in the month of April, we did $1.9 billion of flow business, predominantly on multifamily properties. Uh, we did do some financing in uh, office. We did do some financing in retail. Um, and we actually 
sold a couple properties in the month of April. Um, but 1.9 billion of flow business for us in the quarter is a very, very active business and shows how active Fannie, Freddie, and HUD are in the multifamily financing markets right now. Um, there's been a lot of question marks as it relates to collections. As everybody knows, April collections in the multifamily space uh, were very strong. Uh, most of the operators who Walker Nellop has lent to were in sort of the mid 90s on the collections front and some all the way up towards 98 and 99% collected in the month of April. We've moved into May and from, this is all anecdotal, this is not a wide survey, but this is to six or seven of our largest clients, which I think represent about 250,000 units across the country. Um, May collections are at or ahead of April. And in most instances of the seven, five of the seven were ahead of April collections in May as it relates to rents collected. And one of those sponsors who has about 30,000 units was a full 10 percentage points ahead of collection numbers. They were at 85% after four days of May and they were only at 75% after four days of April. So, um, so far so good as it relates to payment of rent uh, at the beginning of the month for May. Um, we've all been focused on that uh, as it relates to both the lending community and the owner community as far as multifamily. And we will see how that plays out for the rest of May and into June. Um, a number of questions also that came in as it relates to retail and what's the future of retail. Some of you may have seen Sam Zell was on Bloomberg yesterday and Zell came out and basically said sort of malls are dead. Um, I, I would challenge Sam on that statement. I, I don't think malls are dead. And um, I think that Americans are gonna try and find a way to adapt to the current environment and still get out and circulate in larger spaces where they feel safe. And um, I think that there's also gonna be pent up demand for retail spend and that people will get back to that. Um, how long that takes and to what degree we get recovery there um, is obviously anyone's guess. But I would just say that I, I don't think that broad-based comments such as malls are dead is probably right. And as I've said in previous calls, We've been seeing strip retail perform very well, particularly grocery anchored strip retail. And some of you may have seen um, some of the stories from the likes of Shake Shack, um, who have really converted their restaurant business into more of a takeout business. Shake Shack stock has done exceedingly well over the last month as they've transformed into more of a takeout business. And I think Shake Shack is a leading indicator of the transformation that we're gonna see in the retail world where restaurants and retail figure out how to adapt to the new normal, figure out how to meet clients' needs and deliver their goods and services in a safe manner, and that we will see economic activity come back, we will see employment come back to those providers of services. Uh, final two before I get to my intro to Glenn and then sort of open the conversation up. Um, on the student housing side, uh, we have seen very good collections finishing out the 2019-2020 uh, student uh, uh, cycle, if you will. Um, there are many, many college students who are still living in their off-campus housing and doing their remote learning from those dorm rooms. Uh, and the fall is obviously binary. Um, some of you may have seen that schools like Purdue have come out and said that they are uh, intent on going back to school in the fall, although they haven't declared that. But they are also going to take a dormitory, take it offline, and hold it as a quarantine area. Um, and they're also likely going to take doubles and turn them into singles. Um, if a school like Purdue opens up and they take a certain amount of capacity offline for a quarantine area, and they take doubles on campus and turn them into singles, that is gonna drive a huge demand for off-campus student housing. So um, while there are many people trying to figure out, well, we still need to hear that Purdue's going back to school in the fall, um, there should be a very healthy market for off-campus student housing when and if, and unfortunately the and if is still in the statement, uh, universities go back to school in the fall. And then the final one is office. Um, clearly office has long-term leases on it. Um, that is not getting hit as it relates to um, clearly the vacancies that we're seeing in the hospitality and the retail world today. Uh, and at the same time, there is no doubt that the office environment is going to be a changed environment when we all get back to it. 
Um, I've spoken to two of our clients over the past uh, day who have both just gotten back into their offices. Um, they've said that many of their workers are just thrilled to be back in an office environment. They're both smaller offices environments, so they're not having to deal with the you know, hundreds of thousands of employees like Jay Carney last week talked about at Amazon, um, and clearly not to the degree of big corporate headquarters where there are hundreds of thousands of people walking around. But in both situations, they were both very specific about saying that people really loved getting back into the office and seeing their colleagues. And whether that's with PPE and having to wear masks and gloves, whether that's in a walled office environment versus a shared workspace, um, and whether they have problems getting in and out of the office buildings because of elevator banks and how many people are allowed into an elevator car at one given time. Um, those are all issues that many, many of us are being challenged with um, as we think about going back into offices. Um, but I can find just as many people who say to me that people will never go back to offices as I can find people saying, Offices are going to do really well because they're going to need more square footage per employee and people will still want to go into offices and interact with one another. So I think it's a little bit too early to make any declaratory statements about the office market, um, but it is, uh, um, it's, fun. it's very good to see people getting back to work and starting to interact with one another on a small scale. So um, I'll now turn over to my guest, Glenn Yankin, who, uh, as I said, has been a friend for many years. Um, holds the um, extremely um, important job of running Carlisle, one of the uh, world's largest and most successful private equity firms. Um, a little background on Glenn, if you don't know it. Um, he has a mechanical engineering degree from Rice University where he played basketball, and I will loop back to that a little bit later in this uh, discussion. Um, he uh, went to Harvard Business School uh, and was a Baker Scholar at HBS. Um, and then went out of HBS after having previously been at McKinsey and at Credit Suisse, uh, both out of college and then between years at HBS, uh, to uh, Carlisle and was one of the very early people at Carlisle, given the firm was only founded in 1987, and he joined them at the end of 1994. Um, and so, Glenn, I, I've got kind of two questions to start out on. The first one is that most people who are Baker scholars at Harvard Business School end up going to places like McKinsey and um, spend their career studying a lot of things and using their big brains to solve other people's problems and not managing great firms uh, like uh, Carlisle. So the first is how did you, how did you uh, if you will, uh, avoid going back to McKinsey? Uh, and then the second thing is tell us a little bit about Carlisle back in 1995 because it was a much smaller firm it was uh, one of the few buyout firms that wasn't based in New York at that time. And everyone didn't think that Washington, D.C. would be a hotbed of private equity, as you all have made it out to be. Great. Well, first, Willie, thank you for having me. And I just really appreciate everybody gathering together here during your lunch hour. Uh, I do want to just express uh, our thankfulness for all the folks that are on the front lines right now. Um, it continues to be a hour to hour, minute by minute uh, fight. And there's some folks that are doing just incredible work. And so I think all of us should just be hugely appreciative to all of them. Um, and Willie, what a place to start back in 1994, 1995. Uh, you know, when I joined Carlisle, uh, I met David Rubenstein very early on. And I was introduced to him when I must say I was actually working at McKinsey. I went to McKinsey right after school for a short period of time. Uh, and uh, when I met David, uh, he said, well, why don't you meet my partners? Uh, we're doing some interesting things. And I was really captivated by the way these three gentlemen uh, were really seeing the future, the way they did business. Um, they're just three really good men. Uh, and so I remember coming home and speaking to my wife and saying, I think I'm going to leave McKinsey and go work at this small startup. Uh, at the time, Carlisle had less than 30 people. Uh, and it was just an extraordinary time in the industry. Uh, so I just look back as being incredibly fortunate uh, to have a chance to get in at the ground level at a firm like Carlisle. Over the last 25 years, it has been just a fabulous uh, evolution of not just the industry, but our firm. And uh, I couldn't imagine being anyplace else. I feel like I have the greatest job in the world. So Talk to me for a moment about Carlisle's position in Washington, because you know your headquarters sit 
between the Treasury building and uh, the, the Capitol building. And um, I think a lot of people, when Carlisle was first founded in D.C., a lot of people thought that Carlisle was going to use, if you will, access to the corridors of Washington as a differentiator in the way that the firm would raise capital and deploy capital. Um, and as the firm has grown and grown and grown, I would, I would think that sort of, if you will, the center of the firm has moved further away from the Capitol building and closer to the Treasury building as it relates to just a massive provider of capital to markets. Talk about, am I correct on that, Glenn, or do you still view being in Washington as a differentiator as it relates to access to deal flow and, 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 and also the types of companies that you all invest in? Well, just, just for context, and I, I think it's a really interesting question, Willie, because as the firm evolved over really the last 25 years since I've been there, we did go from having one office uh, and really being very Washington-centric, not just from a policy standpoint, but the kinds of businesses we invested in were generally near us, um, to today offices, uh, 30 offices around the world in more than 20 countries. Uh, we have nearly 1,800 employees uh, with really investment activities ranging from private equity to private real estate to private energy and infrastructure and credit all over the world. Uh, and what that has really uh, reflected is just a, a very global view of where investment opportunities are. Yes, being in Washington has continued to always be a differentiator, um, although we have a big office in New York today. But being headquartered in Washington, I think, just gives us uh, a different position, a different, a different perspective on things. Um, many of our investors do appreciate the fact that sometimes we have some unique insights into what's happening in Washington. But you know, as the firm has grown, we have become you know, quite global. Uh, and what's going on in London and what's going on in New York and what's going on in Beijing and Hong Kong and Tokyo are equally important. And so I think our, our roots really did give us a great foundation. Uh, but today, we're a global investment firm, and we really do rely on our global perspectives more so than anything else today. So let me dive in for a moment to, the, to both the four strategies that you all are on and get your thoughts as it relates to at this time. So you all, I think, have about $224 billion of total AUM. Uh, and in that, you've got your corporate private equity business, you've got your real estate business, you've got a global credit business, and then you've got your investment solutions business. Um, can you talk for a moment, Glenn, given where we are in the cycle, um, what you're seeing both across the portfolios in each one of those different, if you will, areas of focus or, or discrete investment strategies. As you, as you look at it, what are you seeing right now as far as opportunities? Is there more opportunity on the cor corporate private equity side, on the real estate slash um, infrastructure side, global credit or investment solutions, and, 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 and why? Is it because you've got capital for it today or you see opportunities for it today? So, Willie, that's a big question. Um, so what I'll, what I'll do, let me, just, let me just do a quick uh, table setting on where we see the economy right now, and I think that will lead to, I think, a good backdrop on each one of the segments. Um, so it's, you know, where we are in the cycle, boy, that's a tough one. I think we're, we're at the bottom of the cycle today. And that has, uh, I think, been something we've been preparing for. I don't think anybody expected to be in a global pandemic with, uh, you know, at, at one point or another, the entire world shutting down. Um, I had a, a friend who runs a very large bank tell me that their disaster recovery plan was targeted towards the idea that one of their big buildings went out. Uh, and the idea that all of them would go out at the same time was beyond their belief. So, you know, I do think where we find ourselves today is, is you know, so far beyond what anybody would have anticipated. But we were expecting that we were a late cycle. And we had felt it in our in pricing and opportunity and and the, and the risk reward trade off. And so our portfolio construction across the whole business uh, had been migrating uh, over the last year plus. Um, you know, for example, and I'll just take real estate while, while I'm here with you, Willie. I mean, over the course of the last few years, our real estate teams had migrated away from most demographic driven uh, real estate investing. And so 
In our U.S. portfolio today, which is our largest portfolio, we have 2% across the whole portfolio in hotel, 2% in traditional office, and 1% in retail. And that's just because those have been in for a while. It wasn't anything we did recently. And similarly, across our private equity business, um, we spend an enormous amount of time making sure that the portfolios are diversified, but we also didn't tra- chase a lot of the trends over the course of the last year. So we have a, 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 a low level of retail. We don't have any real hotel. We have, I think, 1% hotel in our broad private equity um, portfolios. Um, we do have a bit of, we have about 5 or 6% of aerospace, but we're really well diversified. Um, and so I think the first stop on this is just having been a little bit um, prepared for an economic reset, nothing like we've seen, I think was, uh, was at least in, in the planning. As I go through each one of the businesses, our corporate private equity business, uh, which is our largest business, and it's just around $85 billion of assets under management today, it's global. And it really benefits from being global. Uh, we have portfolio companies in China and in India and in South America, of course, the United States and Europe uh, and Africa. And, and I think that perspective has been incredibly helpful as we've gone into uh, this pandemic. Um, of course, it started in Asia. And I think we all forget that while we're sitting uh, in, in shelter in place, all of our Chinese colleagues were doing this back in January. Uh, and so that gave us a chance as a firm to really begin to prepare. Uh, and I think it gave us a little bit of a head start. Uh, and what that has resulted in, I think, is good preparation in preparing our portfolio, which I said is very diverse, uh, for what is an extraordinary economic shock. And really, we can talk about where things sit economically uh, a bit later. Um, and Glenn, just for a second, have you seen anything as it relates to, since you have such extensive investments in China and Asia, what have you seen as it relates to the recovery there? Because a lot of people have been sort of looking over there to sort of say, is that a model to the recovery in the U.S.? Um, what, what are early signs? Because you saw early signs of it, of the crisis coming to America. What has it done now kind of on the other side of them bending the curve and getting back to work? Yeah, I think there's some, there's some um, encouraging data out of China. And, and I think what that data would suggest is that uh, industry – and, and capacity can stand back up reasonably quickly. Uh, you know, China has is is got a unique system and therefore their ability, I think, to uniformly manage things was incredibly helpful. Um, but we've seen capacity, uh, capacity in, in restaurants, capacity in port uh, uh, operations uh, pick way back up um, to the point where it's not quite where it was uh, pre-COVID-19, but it really is, from a capacity standpoint, uh, pretty darn close. Um, I think the big, the big observation has been certain parts of the Chinese economy have rebounded well, and other parts have been um, a, a sticky slow, uh, and that's understandable. So the parts that have rebounded well are the, the parts that you would anticipate. So consumer demand in staples. Consumer demand, um, consumers do want to get out. Um, we, so we've seen a, a real rebound in the more basic consumption. What we haven't seen uh, is a big rebound in uh, buying really heavy goods um, or things associated with material capital spending in businesses. Uh, and I think there's just a continued concern about the pace of the recovery and safety. Uh, and I think health concerns will be the biggest issue in this recovery coming out. One last interesting observation is auto sales in China have rebounded substantially. And in fact, expectation is there will be growth year over year, not, not growth uh, from February to March, March to April, but this, this, uh, there's a few weeks here where there's been growth year over year. And that really does reflect a meaningful shift from wanting to, ride mass transit or fly, uh, and in fact, translate that into driving. We're watching traffic patterns in particularly Beijing uh, increase substantially. There's 11% more traffic during rush hour in Beijing today versus last year. Uh, And so 
Really, the short answer after a long description is we're seeing some reasonably, uh, I'd say, good data out of China recovery. But I think the areas that we all expect to be tough are tough. Um, and they all relate to consumer confidence, particularly around big purchases, which require financial stability, travel, which require safety expectations, and companies who have dialed CapEx way back, uh, turning that CapEx back on. So trying to stay sort of on the, the series of events and looking at, at Asia and China specifically as, as somewhat of an allegory for us, have you all found opportunities to deploy fresh capital into that market? Um, or is it still too early and the, 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 the long-term impacts haven't really started to show themselves to present opportunities for you all to go in and buy new portfolio companies and make investments? or? provide a huge amount of debt capital to the market because it's needed. Yeah, um, so Willie, as we, as we were just, just two minutes ago, you know, the private equity business has got its own characteristics. I'll come to that in two seconds. Our private credit business, which is just about 50 billion um, and cuts across a whole bunch of strategies, uh, is, our, is our busiest area today. Um, and then our real assets business, which is energy infrastructure and real estate, all private, um, has got, of course, different dynamics in each one of those sectors. And then our portfolio construction business, which, we, which is about $50 billion as well, uh, continues again <clears throat> to be active in particular areas. And let me cover them. So the tip of the spear in investment activity today is credit. And <clears throat> credit is uh, where the first opportunities in recoveries tend to present themselves its first dislocation, and by the way, the dislocation closed very quickly. It was your, your opening comments around, you know, of course, what's happened in spreads. Um, as, soon as, as soon as the federal government came in and provided an enormous amount of liquidity support for all of these markets, a lot of the initial distress trade went away. It went away very quickly. Um, and, but what we are seeing in the world of credit is real needs for companies to actually meet some liquidity issues, but then also as they see the recovery coming, they're, they're preparing to invest in both CapEx and working capital and growth. And we view that as a real opportunity for a lender like Carlisle. It gives us a chance to structure it particularly for a company's needs. There's good capital availability and we see lots of opportunities there. So this is what we call opportunistic credit and I think that really is the most active area. Similarly, across the platform, um, we see this exact same liquidity need um, as opposed to traditional big private equity deals presenting itself in almost every asset class. Uh, and in private equity, people refer to you know, pipes or, or structured investments into private companies. Uh, in infrastructure, it's the same. And in, indeed, in real estate, it's the same. Uh, and then finally, I, I, would, I would tell you that we're seeing an enormous amount of activity in our um, investor solutions business. And that business, it's one of its largest and growing, uh, fastest growing areas, is actually uh, in secondary purchases of other investors' interests. And again, in a world where there's liquidity constraints uh, with investors and there is a deep understanding of what's happening in the market, our team there has been pretty active as well. So I think we're going to see this progress, Willie, over the course of the next six to nine months, as <clears throat> today it's credit, secondaries, it's going to move into liquidity solutions for companies that come from private equity style structures, um, but across all the asset categories. And it really won't be for a while to where we see the traditional private equity style purchases that, you know, or buy a whole company, take a company private kind of structure. Uh, my last quick comment is of course Asia is ahead of everybody and so I think the opportunities in Asia are presenting themselves uh, earlier than of course they are in the, in the United States and Europe. Yeah, so um, on that I want to, as it relates to opportunities, there was a question that came in beforehand is it, on where the stock market is today in the United States and the fact that the equity markets at 24,000 on the Dow really haven't fallen off that much and is the worst behind us. So to your point, as it relates to the opportunities that haven't really presented themselves in Asia, um, what's your, as far as the US economy is concerned, 
the, the, the question was sort of saying, if the equity markets are where they are, that means that the worst is behind us. And is there going to be the opportunity to deploy capital? And you may have seen over the weekend, Warren Buffett at their annual meeting said, you know, we're having a hard time finding opportunities to invest in. And I think in this Sam Zell interview yesterday in Bloomberg, he said a similar thing. It's it, fair to say, A, it's too early to tell. Uh, and then B, give me your thought as it relates to kind of the trough that we're going to be in here between what appears to be the advent of the crisis and then when we start to see GDP kick back in. Yeah. So the, the first component of this is what is the, what is the economic recovery curve look like? And that's the hardest thing to answer. And I, I do think that um, our general view, it's a U, not a V. Um, and how long the bottom of the U is, it's hard to tell right now. And I think that's the biggest factor into deployment and capital opportunities. Why? First, the longer it stretches out, the more opportunities there are going to be for liquidity solutions. Really good companies that just need capital in order to either prepare for the recovery or meet a, a gap in liquidity um, in, in this in this U. Um, and I think that is the disconnect between the public markets and the private markets today. I think we generally have seen a very quick rebound in public markets, and I think that reflects public markets' uh, ability to look past the disruption. Um, I think our view is that the recovery will take uh, longer and it'll be filled with fits and starts. And so our sense is that will correspond to a fair amount of volatility in the public markets as the expectations get recalibrated along the way. I, I would say, Willie, if it ends up being a V from an economic recovery, then we're all going to cheer and be really happy. Um, and I think the idea of trying to race in and do that fabulous deal that makes a career, that's just not what Carlisle's about. What we're about is trying to make very thoughtful investments right now. And as I said, we're trying to use, use our capital and our, and our network and our, I think our global platform to really have a great perspective on this. Last quick comment is that it is this shape of the recovery and how long it's going to take that will in fact define um, which industries particularly uh, present the best opportunities. And I just want to make sure I was clear. We're actually starting to see opportunities in Asia today um, as we see that recovery, um, but they're in the kinds of sectors that you would expect. Um, and we've seen uh, innovative healthcare, we've seen technology, uh, we've actually seen uh, many parts of the financial services sector uh, really be quite robust um, during this time period and we think have great growth. And in fact, some areas, even in, in core manufacturing and industrial land have been quite resilient. Um, and so there will be a, a, a you know, big segmentation of sectors uh, and business models um, that will really differentiate the real true winners that come out of this and companies that are going to come out a little more sluggish. Will you talk for a moment about your investor base? Um, you all uh, obviously right now manage well over $200 billion. You have um, long-standing relationships with the largest providers of institutional capital around the globe. Um, what's, what's on their mind? Um, are they looking to put more money to work? Are they pulling back? Um, and, and, and how much liquidity is there out there on the private capital side of things? So, so the, the, inst the global institutional investor base went in and to talk about it as, uh, as this um, kind of homogenous investor base is of course wrong because each investor has its own as 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 its own dynamic. I won't, I won't ask you specifically about the Saudi government. So I, I was trying to make it broad without going specifically no, at, at investors. But, it, but what's 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 most interesting is that comparing comparing this pandemic uh, you know true financial disruption uh, and economic disruption to what we saw back in the great financial crisis, the investor community, the institutional investor community is in a very different place. And the, the community, investor community today has a much better handle over what's in their portfolio, what their liquidity needs are, 
And therefore, uh, when the big disruption happened with, with the you know, huge market fall off in March, uh, and the big questions around what was this going to mean from an economic standpoint where you had literally you know, data coming out of Heathrow Airport where they were running at 97% down on capacity. Um, investors were quickly searching for information. Um, how, are things, how are things performing? What are you seeing in your portfolio? So that they could get a, real, a, a much better balance of what they've got and therefore assess how they want to move forward. And our general take is that in general, there will be, a, 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 of course, a reduction in fundraising activity across the industry this year as the institutional investor community kind of catches its breath. With that said, I think there will be some very important uh, commitments in fundraising and investing done this year from, the, from this investor community as they, of course, invest behind credit opportunities uh, and, and, and dislo dislocation-driven opportunities, but also as they lean into some of their longest-term relationships uh, and partner through this. And so I think there will be fundraising activity. It'll be just down um, from what it has been historically. Uh, and I guess lastly, there's been a, there's been a um, remarkable uh, increase in, in interaction and information flow as a result of the ability to use Zoom uh, in order to really cut down what used to be travel time and you physically had to see each other. And, and, and all of a sudden, we've been able to establish a, a, a cadence and a data flow and sharing of ideas with our global investor base in a way that we never really, really uh, could believe um, right now. And so I will say that one of the big shifts that I foresee as a result of this is the sustained use, even after we're through this pandemic, of this kind of technology to enable just a much deeper interaction with investors, but in a very efficient way. Yeah. Um, so on that, you, you bring up the fact of travel and Heathrow volumes off 98%. I know you guys have a big infrastructure project going on at JFK Airport right now. You guys have been longstanding investors, very long in the energy markets, uh, aerospace as well. As you, as you look at the various sectors right now, Glenn, um, clearly certain things are working, other things aren't working. Um, any, I'm particularly interested in energy just because of where oil prices are right now and sort of everything kind of drives off of that, if you will. You guys have made lots of investments in both, if you will, um, uh, traditional energy as well as new energy of renewables. Um, with oil where it is right now, um, what are you feeling good about in the, in the energy space and what are you sort of saying it's going to be a, it's going to be a slog out of this given where oil prices are right now? Yeah. Can I start with JFK? Yeah, please. Uh, so one of the, one of the things that I think we're, um, most proud of is the fact that the redevelopment of JFK and our piece of JFK is the new Terminal 1, which is the international terminal. Um, that work has continued. Um, and one of the great uh, developments there has been the coming together of the, our union investors, um, uh, who's a, the, the unions are a great partner for us in this project, the, the Port Authority, the banks and the airlines um, to, to come together and recognize that, that this is really a construction project over many years. And in fact, the, the, the passenger dependency of JFK for our project doesn't really start um, for, for uh, four plus years because we actually have to build a new terminal. Um, but to watch everybody come together and recognize how important this project is for New York, for the country, and most importantly, at this time, has been great. Uh, and so uh, we continue to progress that project. We, we are uh, moving through the last stages of contracts and all that kind of uh, very, very important detail. Um, but, but that project uh, is one that is important to move forward. And so before we jump to energy, then uh, just on that as it relates to infrastructure, given Carlisle's 
both physical presence in Washington, D.C. and all that's going on. Do you know, Glenn, whether there's been any talk about a significant infrastructure bill? Because as you think about the daunting challenge, and I know you're working on this right now as it relates to putting people, getting retraining in, in Virginia to put people back to work when the economy comes back. And so, first of all, I salute you for your efforts on that. But what I think has been missing from the conversation about the CARES Act and CARES Act 2, 3, and 4 and everything else has been some type of infrastructure bill to put people back to work exactly as those workers are working to redo Terminal 1 at JFK right now. Do you know if there's any infrastructure bill being contemplated? And has Carlisle kind of raised their hand saying, guess what? We understand this stuff and we know how to invest in public-private partnerships and you ought to put together some type of package to put people back to work. So, Willie, the, the biggest uh, component of all of that right now is the, is the recognition that that Congress and the administration are incredibly focused on the management of the pandemic, the health crisis, and supporting the economy. And it seems that, of course, that has the their vast majority of their attention. Um, I think an infrastructure bill would be great. Uh, to be honest, I think it's going to be tough to get one done in this in this environment, just given all the other things on their plate. Um, with that said, you know, we were always an advocate of, of infrastructure support that actually included the private sector. The kinds of things that we have been able to progress at JFK, I think are incredibly innovative uh, and really do bring to bear a lot of the learnings from around the world on how to develop infrastructure. Uh, so while, while we'd, be, we'd be supportive and hopeful uh, of an infrastructure bill, I just think there's so much on everybody's plate in Washington right now that um, we don't expect one. Yeah. We don't expect one. So on the energy piece, I know you, um, I listened to an interview you did um, probably about a year or so ago where you talked about the fact that um, investing in renewables is something that Carlisle is very focused on that is, 80% um, of the world's uh, energy comes from fossil fuels, that is that moves down towards 70% just as a matter of technology and going from sort of coal-based electricity to alternatives-based electricity, that Carlisle is going to be in that space. So given where oil prices have moved, given where the cost of renewable energy has moved, what's the outlook now? Because you guys are deep in these markets, and I think it'd be very telling to people not only where there's opportunities as far as investments, but then also, you know, where oil is, is having just a dramatic impact on, you know, every sector pretty much right now. So talk energy for a moment, if you would. Sure. Um, so what's happened in the energy markets over the course of the last three months uh, has actually been a double black swan event. Um, so we've, there's been two things that, that have happened. One is, of course, the tremendous demand contraction uh, as a result of the global economy effectively shutting down. Uh, and the expectation is in the month of April and into May that there was about a 30% reduction in demand for crude, uh, and that may be a little light um, and with airlines grounded and industry closed and transportation uh, way down. Um, what we what we also saw at the same time, of course, was some some really difficult moments on the supply side, uh, as the agreements around what to do with supply started out the, in the wrong direction. <laughs> Let's put more supply in the market, uh, and it took a while for the industry, and particularly uh, OPEC plus uh, Russia, to come together and agree to actually constrain supply. Meanwhile, market forces are doing exactly what market forces do. Um, one of the great adages in the, in the energy business is that the best solution for low prices is low prices. Uh, and of course, what's happening is production is in fact being shut in because it's not economic to, to produce oil and sell it at these prices today. And so I think the expectation is in the United States that where we had been producing uh, 13 million barrels a day, that over the course of the year, that production will come way down, as much as uh, as much as four million barrels a day down, um, which is just a substantial reduction uh, in supply into the market. Um, of course, the long-term uh, issue here is going to be the pace of the recovery. Now, we're already seeing 
in China, uh, automobile uh, traffic uh, increasing and therefore demand for gasoline, et cetera, increasing. Um, and we're seeing the exact same thing happen in Europe. Even early days, uh, one week into the European uh, gradual opening, particularly with German, Germany leading the way, um, you see demand for, for, for diesel and for petrol uh, up 5 7%. So um, we'll see a rebound in demand. Um, I think the big issue for energy on a go-forward basis is, in fact, going to be where the supply and demand settle out. Our sense is it'll take into next year for it to re recalibrate and rebalance. Um, however, the market is, I think, pretty actively in front of that. You can see oil prices today are really low. And in fact, the forward curve, which tends to overreact in these circumstances, uh, has oil uh, rebounding over the next two, three, four years, you know, $25, $30. So um, this will still play out over a period of time as the supply demand uh, corrects itself. One of the interesting developments, and back to your, your comment around this energy transition, um, is in fact the role of both natural gas and renewables in the transition for power production. Um, and with natural gas prices uh, incredibly low and expected to stay low for a long period of time, and the ability to construct and contract uh, wind and solar predominantly at overall costs of energy delivery that are comparable with a new build in a fossil fuel we really do expect to see a over the over the next uh, you know call it 10 20 years a substantial replacement of higher carbon content power generation with lower carbon content or zero carbon content uh, and that evolution where where gas plus uh, uh, renewables and a large part of it uh, renewables we think is a very interesting long term trend and which is why we think uh, particularly renewables are a great place to invest right now yeah, that's, that's such an interesting comment as it relates to, if you will, some of the positive impacts of this crisis, if you will, and how it's transforming things. I read an article in the New York Times day before yesterday about the fact that April was the first month that more electricity in the electric grid in America came from renewables than came from coal. And in that article, it said that um, only 15.2% of electricity generated in the United States in the month of April came from coal. The data point that caught my eye was that that is down from 50, 50 zero percent in 2008. So in, although April is lower than most because of um, uh, a number of market dynamics, as you just point out, as it relates to the cost of renewables at this time, it is just stunning that we've gone from 50% of our electricity being generated by coal in the United States to in the month of April, 15.2, and I believe in January it was at 20%. So it's just a full sale, wholesale change as it relates to the energy sector in the United States and, and, and who's providing uh, the source of energy. Yeah, and I think what will be interesting to watch is what happens when offices begin to open back up and air conditioners get turned back on and I think that the one thing about power is it is a light switch. <laughs> and so we're going to end up as watching this recovery uh, really inf have, a, have a meaningful impact on the power grid itself uh, and how it's brought back up. Because, you know, there, it's not like the power grid is shut down. What's happened over the course of the last two months is we've seen anything from two to five to 10% reduction in the overall demand for power. And that's with industrial and commercial demand coming down and, and residential demand as we all work from home go up. Um, and as we begin to move back into uh, our office setting to some degree, uh, we'll begin to see that shift again. And I think we'll get, end up getting both. We'll be getting both uh, commercial, industrial and office demand and a continued uh, amount of residential demand. And so I think, of course, depending on weather over the summer and how hot it is and how, many, how high the air conditioners go, I think we'll see an in, a, a rather interesting uh, case study in what happens when economies throttle up and down on overall demand for electricity. Can you talk for a moment, Glenn, about your leadership position on ESG? Um, Carlisle has been a real, uh, it's been a real leader, not just in the private equity space, but across your portfolio companies as it relates to um, ESG standards 
Um, I was I was amazed and extremely pleased to see that 50% of your AUM is managed by females. Um, can you talk for a moment about what got you so focused on ESG? And I can only imagine that Carlisle's leadership position there has been extremely beneficial to your fundraising efforts. Yes. So one of the clear recognitions is that, and I'm going to use the word impact and ESG uh, and diversity in different buckets because they, they, there, there are significant, significantly important components to each one, but I'm going to throw it all together for impact right out of the box here. One of the, one of the recognitions is that impact is not an investment strategy. Uh, you know, Willie, there's a lot of folks who say we have an impact fund. And I don't know, what, does that mean the rest of their businesses aren't it? You know, don't do any of that. I, I, that I just, I've never quite really got my head around. But what we believe is that if you invest for impact, then you will take a good business and it will become a better business. Um, and if you, in fact, embed into your uh, assessment process uh, criteria that you're going to not only diligence these topics, but there are companies that, in fact, you can take a company that's not so great at it and make it much better on an ESG scorecard, and you create value. You can take a business that, in fact, um, the whole business plan is around some very innovative ESG strategy. There's a company we own called Genealogy, which is in Spain, that basically makes genes look acid washed. Um, but they've come up with this really cool technology that reduces the amount of water and doesn't use a lot of chemicals. Um, and it's just a spectacularly fast growing company. And by the way, they've done some great things during the COVID-19 epidemic to use their capacity to really help their communities. But that kind of investing is not, again, it's not an impact strategy. It's just a really good company. <laughs> and, and similarly, when we take a business and I'll go back to energy, you take a business that one of our businesses, Neptune, uh, which has a lot of North Sea production, and we can, we can actually reduce the carbon footprint per barrel because you electrify the rigs. Um, you do a much better job with flaring. You do all the things that you need to do in order to fundamentally reduce the carbon footprint. Then all of a sudden, you can take good businesses, and they can become great businesses. And so... That's step one, uh, and I think it's important that it, be, you know, it just has become part of our dialogue at Carlisle. How do we take a good company and make a great? ESG is a you know, primary factor into that to do it really well. I think our second big moment was you know, we all recognize that if we sit with a group of people that all look the same, that went to the same school, and this is Willie and I are guilty, went to the same school and have had the same training, and the same experiences, you're going to get very similar answers. And what is clear is when you have diverse teams that have diverse experiences and you create an environment where that kind of experience is brought to bear to make a better decision, then all of a sudden your investment outcomes uh, in, are, are improved. And that's just clear. The, 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 the data, the research is overwhelmingly in support of that. And so we felt that one of the big steps we needed to take was to make um, diversity and inclusion not a program at Carlisle, but to embed it in the way we think about how to grow Carlisle. And so we were really, really fortunate, uh, uh, gosh, a year and a half ago now, to be able to bring in uh, just a, ro a rock star uh, chief diversity and inclusion officer, a uh, woman named Cara Helander, and she joined us. And really, we've s just systematically gone through uh, our, our whole firm and spent time thinking about how to do a much better job at this. Now, I'll tell you, as an industry and as Carlisle, we've still got a long way to go, but I think we've made really, really good progress. Um, and the key to this is it's about diversity of experience and diversity of thought, not box teching. Um, and so we look at it today and we've got, you know, a, we think of a pretty representative uh, group of folks that join us every year. Uh, about half of the folks that joined Carlisle last year uh, were women. Uh, we, have, we have a good uh, set of senior women at Carlisle that, that as you said, manage uh, a lot of the AUM. And we just think that's, um, we just think that makes us better investors. So 
both at the portfolio and at the firm level, th this is about just building a better business uh, and recognizing that when you actually embrace a lot of the basic inputs of diversity of thought, lowering carbon footprint, thinking about how to save energy, trying to increase efficiency, you, you just get you just get better outcomes. Yeah. So I we've got about five minutes left, and I want to um, I want to talk a little bit about where you see the world a year from now, um, and then I also have my final basketball question for you at the very end, which I teed up at the beginning. Uh, but if you if you look at a year, Glenn, um, where's the equity market a year from now? Where's the ten year a year from now? Um, there was a Elliott Capital letter that came out. You may have seen it this past week. That was um, a very long letter. God, it was about 30 pages. We talked about a lot of different things, but one of the things that they were talking about is the fact that inflation is going to start to hit our economy. And I read it, and I and I sat there, and I just said, "Where's the inflationary pressure going to come from? It's not going to come from the cost of fuel. It's not going to come from the cost of labor." The only thing that's going to drive inflationary pressure is the amount of money we're printing right now. Um, and right now, it appears that as long as people continue to buy 10-year bonds, at, I think the 10 years at 70 basis points today, uh, we'll be able to print as much money as we need to get ourselves out of this crisis. And I just don't see inflation coming in. So 10-year, a year from now, is there inflationary pressure? What do the equity markets look like? Um, what's your outlook just a year from now? Don't, don't, don't go further out than that unless you want to. Yeah, so so I am always hesitant to disagree with Paul Singer. Um, so yeah, yeah, I hear you. With, with that is with that is. Uh, I'm pleased. This is you and me doing groupthink from both having gone to the same business school together. But go yeah, ahead. Exactly. So um, I guess I, I first just have to acknowledge it's incredibly difficult to to think one year out. It's easier to think five years out. Yeah. And it's easier to think a month out. But it's really hard to think one year out. And it goes back to a lot of the really difficult uh, reopening challenges. Um, and, of course, into that one-year equation has to go, well, have we made progress with the vaccine? Do we have, a, do we have therapies that people trust? Have we seen uh, reinfection uh, really force big cities to reclose? What's happened in the Southern Hemisphere? Uh, and so, you know, those inputs make... Uh, really having any kind of uh, prospective view for one year really hard. What, what do we think uh, can happen over the course of the next year? As I said, I, we think this is going to take a bit, this is going to take longer as opposed to shorter, so it's a U. It's going to have fits and starts. Um, the fits and starts uh, are going to, in fact, disrupt and cause um, a fair amount of volatility in the markets because people have to reset expectations each time, and I think expectations in the public markets today are uh, a bit optimistic um, on how quick we can move through this to an economic recovery. Um, with that said, uh, and this is just borrowing a quote from Warren Buffett, you know, never bet against America. Uh, and I think the progress that we can make with regards to innovation around a vaccine, uh, innovation around therapy, uh, innovation around how we treat patients um, will potentially provide some upside on the health side of all of this, um, which will, of course, then help the economy. Um, so let me let me try and push you a little bit on that. Let me band you. Um, the Dow is closer to 30,000 or 20,000? You know, the great, Willie, I'm going to keep it being very evasive because the good the good thing about <laughs> this is we're not, we're not public company investors. Uh, do, do I think that, do I think that, that investing in companies today you can find good good acquisition opportunities. I think prices are going to still be high. Um, you know, sellers and buyers uh, mark to market at a different rate, <laughs> and so sellers still have expectations. Their companies are worth a lot, or their properties are worth a lot. But I do think that if things that are invested in in 2020 and 2021, are we going to be happy we invested in them as long as we did our did our work correctly in 2024 and 2025? You bet. Um, and the it really is just going to be a meaningfully volatile uh, kind of nine to 12 months in front of us. I, I have to say, I think that the recently the IMF outlook uh, was that we would at the end of 2021 um, be at levels of GDP 
that we had at the end of 2019. Um, and that's a longer recovery than I think most people are thinking. But, you know, that's a realistic outlook. You know, um, it's so a real the, the luxury of being a private investor. It is. Uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, so um, we are we are at the bottom of the hour. And so I want to uh, I want to finish with one final thing, which was as I was doing my research on you, Glenn, you are the quintessential successful, steady leader. You are um, you embody everything that one would think of as somebody who is um, both steady in their thinking, looking to the future, et cetera, et cetera. But when I went back and looked at your stats from your Rice basketball career, <laughs> your free throw percentage was only 41%. And I'm just wondering how a guy who's been steady Eddie had a free throw percentage at 41%. So, Willie, I, I, I am stunned you were able to even find stats. I mean, I was one of those, I was one of those folks that had really high ambitions when I went to college that I was going to play in the NBA, although I went to Rice. And so there's a, you know, there's a reality there. Um, and I learned each year in college um, that the most important thing I was going to do was graduate with a good degree and go get a job. Um, I will say just quick, quick note. I, um, we were playing, uh, we were playing Marquette uh, up in the first tournament that was played at the new arena uh, up, up in Milwaukee. And, uh, and I didn't play that much, but this game I happened to get a chance to play in. And, and it was in the first half, and there's 16,000 fans in the place. And I got fouled, and I went to the free throw line. And I airballed the first one by about <laughs> four feet. It bounced before it went out of bounds, and all 16,000 people yell, yelled and screamed. And, and then the second one, I switched. Uh, and so I was my normal kind of 50% from the foul line. And then play happened and whatever, and I got subbed out a few minutes later. I went running over to the bench, and a head coach looked at me and said, what happened on that first free throw? And I said, if I'd only had more pancakes for breakfast, I would have made the first one too. Um, but I will say that, you know, shooting free throws in an arena stacked with 16,000 people, I was happy to go one for two. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's all been swishes ever since. So, um, Glenn, I want to thank you a ton for taking the time to join me today to give your insights into the markets. It's, uh, as I said at the top, it's a real honor and a pleasure to have you join me. And I know that all of your comments were very well received and very informative to everyone who tuned in. So thank you, my friend. Uh, to everyone who joined us today, uh, thanks. And we'll be back next week with another one. Um, have a good week and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks. Willie, thank you. Thank you, Glenn.